Then, then of course, now in the last uh, this year, you have all companies trying to jump onto the uh, large language model bandwagon, the chat GPT. And, you know, the, there's obviously this hype that, oh, this can do everything. And it is incredibly impressive when you talk to it. So we're going through something absolutely historic. Technologies across the board are growing exponentially. It's a disruption that's going to completely redefine the way businesses compete. In the next decade, we're going to lose 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies. The exponential growth of computing is continuing. AI is nowhere near its full potential. Whether you like it or not, that the future cannot be stopped by anyone. Hi there, everybody. This is Mark Verbenkoff, and welcome back to the Future Tech and Foresight podcast. This is going to be episode number 130. So as you've been uh, following the podcast lately, you've no doubt come across the fact that we've delved into the kind of evolving world of AI uh, pretty extensively. So it makes absolutely perfect sense that uh, we're very, very close to the one year anniversary of ChatGPT launching. So we're going to be diving more into AI today. And in this episode, we're gonna be zoning in on a rapidly evolving segment of AI namely chatbots and personalized AI assistants, which again fits perfectly with the anniversary of ChatGPT. So joining me on this little exploration is Peter Voss, who is a pioneer in the AI industry. We're gonna be unpacking some critical areas today from the current challenges in call centers to the revolutionary impact of hyper-personalized AI in customer service. We'll compare the early iterations of chatbots with the advanced capabilities of platforms like Ago, which Peter has been instrumental in developing. Our conversation does go beyond just these technicalities. We discuss the economic and social implications of blending AI with human interaction in business settings. We also look at how these AI-driven systems stack up against their human agents or counterparts, and what unique features does Ego bring to the table, especially when compared to other platforms like ChatGPT. And most importantly, where is this technology heading? So Peter Voss is a renowned figure in the world of artificial intelligence. He's a serial entrepreneur, engineer, and inventor. And his journey specifically in AI began with a quest to understand and replicate human intelligence, leading him along with others like Ben Gertz to coin the term artificial general intelligence. And as the founder, CEO, and chief scientist at Ago.ai, Peter is at the forefront of revolutionizing conversational AI technology. His current mission is to provide hyper-intelligent, hyper-personal assistance to enhance customer experiences and engagement. A visionary in AI, Peter's contributions extend, however, beyond technology into philosophical discussions about the rational ethics, free will, and the future of artificial minds. And that definitely comes across in today's interview, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and I hope that you do as well. Hi there, Peter. Thank you very much for coming onto the podcast today to talk about one of my uh, favorite discussions, artificial intelligence. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, also one of my favorite topics. <laughs> <laughs> I should hope so. <laughs> um, so, uh, so as I mentioned before, I always ask my guests, uh, what initially got you interested in the industry that you're working in or on the technology that you're working on? So if you want to kick us off uh, with that, that'd be, that'd be great. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I actually started out as an electronics engineer, so working on hardware, and I started my own electronics company. Then I fell in love with software, and my company turned into a software company. So I ended up developing a comprehensive ERP software package, and that company was quite successful. We went from the garage to 400 people and did an IPO. And it's really that when I exited that company that allowed me to, to think about, well, what big problem do I want to tackle? You know, uh, awesome. And what struck me is that software is actually quite stupid <laughs> you know um it it doesn't think it doesn't reason it, it doesn't learn uh and you know i was very proud of the software that we developed but still um that that realization got me to the point where i said how can we build software that can actually think and learn and reason the way humans uh, do and it took me on a five-year journey of uh, studying all different aspects of intelligence starting with 
epistemology, theory of knowledge. How do we know anything? You know, is there reality out there that that we can know? How can we be certain of things? And you know, from psychology, how do children learn? And what do IQ tests measure? How does our intelligence differ from animals? And then, of course, I studied as well what the work that had been done in the field of AI, and and that's really what um, you know. It's just so super exciting um, the whole idea of being able to build a thinking machine. Um, and um, 2001, I then started my first AI company, and since then, I've been alternating between development, uh, um, you know, development projects where we focused on increasing the IQ and then commercializing the technology. So um, I've basically done two stints of five years of development and uh, two stints of five years of uh, commercialization. And my current commercial company is now working, you know, that's up and running. And I'm actually turning back my focus on development again okay okay interesting and and this uh, this current company is of course uh, ai go and um what and we're going to be talking about chatbots uh, today of course so what uh what were kind of the early chatbots not meeting right so there's like the expectations that people had about chatbots and maybe they weren't meeting certain expectations, or they were, as you said, maybe too stupid. They're not very necessarily useful. Yes, ab absolutely. So uh, I think we've all experienced, and by chatbots, I think we can, uh, you know, for the purpose of this discussion, include uh, automated systems that you talk to, you know, when you uh, call into a company, which of course have been around a lot longer before chat became a thing. Um, so, you know, calling into a company and talking to an automated system. I mean, people typically hate these systems. And even chatbots today, most of them are pretty frustrating. And, you know, why is that? Well, the technology that is being used by most companies, almost all companies, is actually pretty simple. It's been around for like 30 years. It's essentially a flowchart type program, you know, where somebody says, well, it asks you this question and then you answer it yes or no, or you give your, your name or your zip code or whatever. But, you know, if there's anything that you want to do differently that the, the system wasn't designed for, it doesn't understand you properly, or you want to jump to a different topic, typically they fail miserably. And, um, you know, it's just, the technology is actually that's out there is, is actually very primitive by and large. And that's why it's so frustrating. I mean, people typically hate these things. You know, they say, I just always press zero to get to an operator. Yeah. That's, that's uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, so of course, AI Go is doing something a little bit different here. Do you want to yes. just, uh, touch on that uh, a little bit, and then we can jump into some? Yes. Um, well, the sim simplest way, uh, yeah, what we do at at uh, IGO, IGO .ai, oh, okay. um is we call it a chatbot with a brain, and you know that makes all the difference. It's not just the flowchart program that we follow, but it's actually a cognitive engine that remembers what you said earlier in the conversation, even in what you said in prior conversations. And it has a deep understanding of what you're saying. So it can switch from one topic to another topic or answer a question that you might interrupt with. And so it it, it uses context, it uses memory, it uses reasoning, and it has deep understanding. And that that's a technology we've basically developed and you know commercialized and perfected um, over the last 15, uh, 15 years. So it's a very, very different approach to what almost all other uh, chatbot technologies use. And uh, how comparable is the interaction with this chatbot compared to, let's say, I mean, the, the most the most famous AI technology right now, ChatGPT? Yes, uh, that, that's a very uh, important question. Now, uh, of course, ChatGPT or large language models are very, very recent, and they are just incredibly impressive in terms of the sort of complexity of conversation that you can can have the amount of knowledge that they have um, and you know they are trained with like almost all of the information that's available you know trillions of parameters um, that that feed into that or words that feed in, in into this 
Um, so they are very, very uh, good at this sort of open-ended conversation and answering questions. Now, the huge limitation that they have, uh, well, there, there are several. Uh, and in fact, the, the name GPT kind of um, already gives, gives a good clue. The first G stands for generative, which means they make up stuff. So, you know, they are trained with massive amounts of information, but that information can be good, bad, and ugly. Mm. And they will basically always try to come up with an answer to whatever you ask them for. And that answer could just be completely made up. Um, you know, so for example, I can say, tell me about the paper I wrote about uh, kidney revival or something, you know, and they'll promptly tell me about a paper on kidney revival complete with that I wrote complete with um, references, which are completely, utterly bogus. Right. So so the first thing is they make up stuff, they're generative. The, so, and, and that's not really fixable. It's inherent in uh, the technology. The second problem is the P, GP, uh, is they are pre-trained. So they are trained in these massive training uh, um, sessions that you know can take weeks or even months in some cases. Uh, for example, ChatGPT is rumored to have cost more than a hundred million dollars to train in this massive training exercise to to digest all of you know all of, all of these uh, billions of of pieces of information. But they are pre-trained, which basically means they cannot learn interactively in real time. And that's a huge limitation. And you know the T is a transformer. Um, uh, model that or the technology that they are based on and that really makes it in makes these limitations inherent uh they use what called uh, back propagation uh which is you know this very slow expensive process of training and they are just in inherently incapable of ingesting new information uh in real time now there are certain hacks that people do you know they have a memory buffer and there are external databases you can do, but they don't fundamentally change the the model that that has been pre-trained. So um, um, imagine hiring a human personal assistant who comes to you and says, uh, "I can do Excel, and I can do QuickBooks, and I know about this and I about, know about that." Great, fantastic. And now you tell them, "Well, we're opening a new branch here, and we have this uh, this product that we're discontinuing, and I just have a new." Uh, business relationship here and the next day they come in and they don't remember anything that you said right. you know that's not going to be very useful that's right. going to get very frustrating so uh, in, in short the generative ai the 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 technology the gpt uh, transformer technology is incredibly useful for answering questions about stuff that is already pre-trained uh, and they're very good at idea generation and now also, at, you know, logos and, and images and pictures and, and so on. But the, there always needs to be human in the loop to basically verify, uh, you know, the quality of the information and to redirect the system by, you know, what's called prompt engineering to basically figure out how do you need to prompt the system to give you the right kind of answer. Um, so they're very powerful for the sort of idea generation and and brainstorming and you know, providing information that's already known, um, but they cannot be relied upon. So, you know, if you're talking about replacing call center agents, companies have very specific requirements. They have legal requirements, they have business rules, they have requirements from marketing that the system needs to behave in a, in a, in a certain way uh, and say things in a very particular way. And uh, that technology really just isn't suitable for, uh, for for those applications, and that's you know where our technology, which is not generative AI, it's cognitive AI. Right. Um, yeah, and I think we'll be focusing on on call centers uh, that industry specifically because that's um, that's like one of the main use cases for Ago's uh, chatbot, if you will, the the cognitive AI. Could you for the for the and for myself, could you? Uh, talk a little bit about the scale of, of call centers, right? Like, I think we've all interacted with them for, you know, customer service, et cetera. But uh, I think it'd be interesting to to know a little bit about the the vastness of this. Of this. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, 
I mean, depending on what uh, exactly how you define, you know, call center operation, help desk and so on, uh, but there are well over 10 million people doing this kind of uh, work. And, um, you know, call center operators have had really a, a, a hard time, especially since COVID. I mean, it's always been difficult, but especially now they have tremendous problems in finding people, first of all, who are willing to do this work. Mm -hmm. Secondly, in training, um, you know, that's non-trivial. Um, but then retention is a huge problem. I recently read a statistic that the, the average longevity is six weeks. Now, obviously, it accounts for a lot of people who come there on on a day two say, whoa, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not going to do this anymore, you know, but uh, it's really they have tr uh, really terrible turnover. And then from a user point of view, um, of, of course, the customer point of view, it's the, the quality can be very, very spotty, you know, that um, some people are really good at the job and uh, others aren't or they're bored or they're in a bad mood or, you know, what whatever or overloaded. Um, and then, of course, you have the wait time, which is terrible, you know, then, uh, I mean, we all know that we talk, try and get through to a bank or, um, you know, medical insurance or something. You, typically, you just sitting there or airline you're just waiting you know waiting and waiting waiting uh, to to connect so it's it, it it's it's really hard for call centers to provide good service um and it's very frustrating from a customer point of view so with our technology not only can we totally eliminate wait time uh, but we can also in many many cases provide better service in fact, much better service than a human can, because our system has instantaneous access to prior conversations, to you know all of the products and things, which the human operator typically wouldn't have. They wouldn't have the the time to look up you know previous uh, interactions, even if even if that capability existed. So the service can actually be much better, and and uh, and no wait time uh, with provided you have an intelligent enough chatbot yeah i i want i want to go back just a uh, final point with regards to call centers this is actually one of the things that i i was curious about or that kind of clicked in my mind when um when we connected in the sense that like okay i talk a lot about emerging technologies on the podcast and call centers for me wasn't necessarily like the, the most exciting thing but then i started realizing oh wait like i use call centers at least a couple times a week you know I've, I've developed this little business that i'm working on and i need help with you know websites or the bank as you mentioned or these other services and i was i was starting to think like just how much society as a whole is kind of held back or all of the it's a good way of saying it like the slowdown of society and the economy based on the amount of improper help that we're getting from these help desks or from these from these call centers uh and i started to think like it was it's actually quite tremendous when you think about it all the interactions that we're having all these times that we're either you know hitting zero so many times or or not getting the answer that we require i think it ha must have a you know a tremendous economical um impact but also kind of a frustrating psychological impact on society as a whole if these if these help desks and call centers in general are just not as efficient or as optimized as maybe what ego is is going to be uh, offering them oh absolutely um I, I mean the the economic cost overall in terms of the inefficiencies uh, must be quite substantial and i mean then you add to it uh, i mean i find myself often you know wanting to do something and i keep pushing pushing putting it off because i really don't want to deal with yeah. the, the the hell of of trying to talk to a human in a in a call center um you know for all the different problems i mean a, a, another problem that is you know a, a, a really a big aggravation is you you wait half an hour you finally get through to somebody you explain your whole story you identify yourself you go through all of that they ask you questions which you may have to look up or something you know uh, like an account number or what your last transaction was or whatever. So you go through all of this this hell. Um, eventually, they identify and then they tell you, oh, sorry, this is the wrong department. I can't help you. Let me transfer you. And they transfer you and it rings and rings and rings and then just cuts off. 
probably. Or maybe if you're lucky, you eventually get through to another person and you start the whole process again, because of course they don't transfer that information. You know, I, I mean, that's just, that's why we hate these things. Um, and, you know, with, with proper automation, you don't need to have any of those frustrations. You know, uh, one of our big customers is 1-800-Flowers group of companies, Harry and David and Popcorn Factory and so on. And, you know, of course they have, a uh, tremendously difficult task, uh, Valentine's Day and Mother's Day, when, you know, their volume goes up like tenfold, you know, of course. And um, with with human operators, it's you simply cannot scale that quickly, you know, so wait times go up. So with, with our system now, there, are no, there is no wait time, you know, that basically with automation, we can scale up instantaneously and you know handle thousands and thousands of uh, uh calls simultaneous calls so there are really a, a lot of advantages in having automation and you know we in in terms of acceptance of people accepting this i think it's an interesting dynamic historically people hate automation for very good reasons so they're reluctant you know they might just straight away say oh, I'm just going to press zero to get to an operator uh, because the automated system is going to be even worse. Um, but A, automation is becoming better. You know, speech recognition has has improved significantly. So the technology has improved. Um, and, you know, for some of the, some of the simpler things, uh, chatbots can be quite effective. But then also we have these sort of demographic differences. Younger people simply do not want to talk to somebody else. <laughs> they just want to do stuff on the web or on chat or whatever. They just want to get stuff done. And we've, what we're finding, the interesting thing is even older people are starting to realize it and, and, and change that, you know, and say, hey, if I can just do this on the web or if I can just do it on my phone and my, my app or that's actually much better. I don't actually want to talk to a human. So the 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 technology is improving on the one hand, and the dynamic of of demographic and and users is is changing. So we're definitely moving um, more and more towards automation. And you know, I just wish I, I just wish more companies had better technology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can can we touch on that uh, maybe fear of automation, right? So my my first hundred episodes was dedicated to to automation, with a large focus on you know labor and uh, technological unemployment. And I think that this is something that any um, autonomous or automated technology focused tech uh, business needs to kind of I think discuss a little bit further in depth, right? So you, we mentioned or you mentioned at the beginning that the average uh, turnaround for for these call centers is about six weeks uh, for for individuals. I would also assume that a lot of these people going into these call centers or help desks, like they really need this kind of work sometimes, right? This is not you know like uh, uh, Ivy League type work in in many cases. How have you uh, or in the discussions with with your clients, how have they? discussed or talked about the fear of their employees um, being completely automated, being replaced? Uh, has there been some sort of discussion of, uh, I think the term is um, like centaur teams, right? So the AI and humans working together, or is your solution just, you know, complete replacement of the, of the human labor force in these, in these companies? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a complex uh, topic. Um, you know, on, on the one hand, um, call, you know, companies are struggling to find staff for call centers. So if they just stopped hiring, mm -hmm. they'd very quickly get down to a core, you know, a level of people that, that actually want to make this their profession. And there are some people who are really, really good at it, that they enjoy it and it's their career. Mm -hmm. And that's great. But they also don't want to handle the, 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 totally mundane things, you know, that that can be automated. So it allows them to, to handle the more interesting cases where the human touch is required, mm -hmm. you know, where maybe a longer product dis description or brainstorming on what somebody might want to buy or how to solve a problem. Um, so, you know, companies, when you talk to them, 
they'll they'll say oh we don't want to lay off any staff but you know that's kind of the politically correct thing to 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 say in reality uh, they all want to save money and if on top of it they can provide a better service and save money they they will do it now of course you have government organizations or unionized shops that say we will not lay off any any people you know and well i mean then if you do automation they're just going to sit there twiddling their thumbs or something you know now in 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 terms of overall um you know joblessness i mean we simply haven't found that because service jobs have sprung up you know they they new service jobs spring up more quickly than automation can replace things i mean basically we don't have unemployment anybody who wants wants to work can work um, so I don't really see that um, as a problem in, in the short run. Now, we can also talk about the future of AI and much more advanced AI, but, you know, that's sometime in the future. Right now, uh, in in terms of, you know, d destroying jobs, no, these are not jobs that, that most people want to do. Yeah, and I like the... Uh... Uh, the point that you made, and this has obviously come up many times on the podcast, where people that want to do that work um, are able to do the more complex or maybe cognitively challenging work, as you were saying, the you know the longer product discussions or you know times where customers have a real difficult issue, um, whereas the AI system can take care of all the mundane, you know, the quick requests um, and offer these people maybe even a more more challenging role in the in the current uh, position that they have. This is something that we see all the time. Whenever automation comes in, people tend to do more high quality work or more cognitively challenging work. Well, correct. Well. I mean, the the, the history show, uh, shows that. I mean, that with all the automation, um, in fact, work hours in America have, if anything, become longer or certainly not much shorter. Uh, so so clearly, it's filling up with additional services that that people want and are willing to pay for yeah um how uh how quickly can your system be implemented in a business let's say like the the, the flower um business mm -hmm. that you're saying for example is this something that can be done within a month or does it take a little bit longer i would assume that the training period would be maybe one of the the longest uh, aspects of it Right. So currently, our focus is to work with uh, enterprise, you know, with larger companies, and typically the whole process of just you know figuring out the integration, security, yeah. all the specifications, business rules, and so on, uh, tends to take quite a lot of time on the company side. You know, just mm -hmm. to actually decide it's a new system or an upgraded system. You know, if they're replacing an existing system, they usually want to upgrade it modernize it and so on so usually that that whole sort of discovery and and making apis available and that tends to take much longer than the actual implementation right. um i mean we've implemented systems you know within just a few weeks two weeks three weeks or something uh but you know typically you you'd be looking at more like you know six weeks or, or something that's if if all the stars align and all the services are available in their you know clear specifications mm -hmm. um because you really want to have deep integration into the backend system so so that the chatbot is in fact um you know or the the voice voice or, or text chatbot is is in fact uh, capable of providing up-to-date information uh and to update uh, the backend system properly with any you know, new orders, changes to the order, or cancellations, or refunds, or whatever you might might have. You know, right, right, yeah, that makes that makes sense. Um, I I can't, I can't remember. I looked I looked at your company uh, a week or two ago. Um, with these chatbots, is the is the um, voice aspect connected to it, or or is it just text? Uh, yes. Um, the, when we launched uh, my my previous um, AI company, in fact, focused entirely on on voice interactions. Uh, that company called Smart Action, uh, they're still going strong. Um, with Igo, we actually decided to start uh, with with chat because that's the fastest growing channel. 
um, more and more companies are moving from you know voice channel trying to push their customers from voice interaction to chat interaction um, but we have just recently introduced voice as well so we now offer essentially omni channel so you could actually start an interaction on voice and then move over to chat or vice versa um, you know and, and uh, seamlessly move from one one channel to to another okay fantastic um, the, the reason I ask is, uh, I was actually just having a conversation with a family member, uh, like two days ago, and I, I was reminded of the example that, uh, I think it came out like seven, maybe 10 years ago now where Google was presenting their newest AI mm -hmm. bot, uh, phoning a, a hair salon, I believe mm -hmm. it was, and making an appointment. And this, right. when, when, when it came out was, you know, fascinating for so many people. And I think the, the video got, you know three or four million views or something crazy like that um, because it was so similar to how a human spoke. I think there was even like an um or hmm, you know, like there was yeah. certain humanistic aspects implemented in that, in that uh, bot, if you will, Google's bot. Right. Um, and we're hearing now with, you know, this whole new generative AI revolution that's been happening over the last year, uh, other technologies, other, you know, bots, if you will, that are not as good as that Google example, but mm -hmm. they're still pretty damn close, right? Like you can still, you can still know that there's that there's a there's a AI behind it, but the the, the right. tone, the structure of the sentence, everything seems pretty human. Um, may, maybe you could talk a little bit about your technology's uh, voice aspects, and then maybe touch a little bit on like how things are going to change over the next, say, five to ten years. Yes. So yes, Google duplexes, uh, that that was a product is in interesting, because um, really, the biggest innovation was exactly sort of putting ums and ahs in there to make it sound like a human. They have, they've actually tried to commercialize this. Um, I mean, I didn't realize it was seven years ago. But yeah, it's a long time yeah. ago. And they, they've been spectacularly unsuccessful in doing it. So the intelligence just wasn't there because they also in inherently tried to just use flowcharts. And, you know, the thing, there's one thing in having a, an impressive demo, especially if you control yeah. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it's very different on having something that actually works in the, in the real world. Now, my philosophy in, it, it has always been you should not fool the customer into believing they're talking to a human. I think that's a, a big mistake. Now, uh, often our customers will disagree. Our enterprise customers will disagree. And they say, we want this to sound just like our humans. Uh, you know, we want the persona, we want the warmth and so on. I really, and, and there are studies to, to show that that's actually a mistake because if people know they are talking to a computer, they're much more likely to just get on with doing what they want to do and not shoot the breeze and right. potentially confuse the system, you know, right. or talk about things, you know, about the ball game or something that the system will have no idea on, you know, how to respond or have a, have a conversation. Or if they suddenly discover that they aren't talking to a human, uh, they'll actually be quite annoyed. So I think there are, are lots of reasons why up front you should say, you know, I'm your automated system, I'm here to help you, you know, or, or, or something. Now, you still want a good quality of, uh, of voice, and you certainly want excellent quality of understanding, you know, of, of speech recognition. Um, but that's just to make it, you know, sound pleasant and, and, you know, not and make it easy to easy to understand. So I think you want high quality um, voice. But I think it's a mistake to put ums and ahs and, and stuff like that um, into it. I mean, a computer doesn't um and ah. Right. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about what your customers have been experiencing so far. So I can only imagine the the efficiency gains that they've been having. Have there been any cases where the um the the chatbot can't respond and then you know learns how to respond and then the next week or in the next day or something they respond properly um how oh, how, oh how yes ab right? absolutely um there always has to be tuning because irrespective of you know how good the technology is or how much prior experience you have 
um, each company, each situation is is has a slightly different dynamic. You know, the way customers uh, speak and what they mean by what they say will be will be different depending on the the, the products, the context. It can even change depending on the weather. You know, if you have storms or snowstorms or something, then certain things may have a different meaning, but that will affect one type of business very differently like you know a triple a towing service it it's much much more critical or what the implications of you know um yeah there's ice on the road or something you know uh, so uh the the kind of tuning process uh you definitely need to do as you gain the experience with the system and then also product changes that you have business rule changes and so on you really want to make sure that the system is is always up up to date mm -hmm. now we are we are not at human uh, level intelligence with our technology i mean nobody is and we certainly aren't so there are clearly situations that the system can't handle. Now, it can either be because it simply lacks the intelligence to understand the deeper point, or somebody maybe isn't very clear, but it can also be simply that APIs don't exist yet for uh, aut automation. You know, that's something that's done through some kind of a manual process on a screen that doesn't have an API. So, um, you know, there are definitely uh, situations that you transfer to an operator. And the way we do that is we uh, transfer to an operator, but we give the operator a summary of what we've already handled. So maybe we've already given them the order status and you know change the delivery address or, or something, but they also want to change a product and there's no API available for that, you know, hypothetically. Um, then it can be passed on to an operator. They know which order you're talking about. We've already changed the delivery address. They don't need to validate the customer anymore. They can get straight into making the product change or, or you know, what, whatever. Uh, so that is very efficient. But um, we we haven't um, automated all, you know, talking about 1-800-Flowers as an example, we haven't automated uh, all aspects of their business yet, but the parts that we have automated um we do we have just under 90 percent 89.5 percent self-service mm -hmm. so you know only 10 percent of of the calls that we can handle uh need to um still need an operator for one reason uh, reason or another so you know that's obviously a tremendous help um in in terms of not you know they they it saves them you know Two or three thousand operators that they have to hire for for Mother's Day, so that's right. Right. very yeah. significant. Yeah, yeah, and especially if these are large businesses, right? Yeah, they match the kind of cost savings that they have. Um, and then, of course, the the important point is uh, customers are able to have their problem solved probably pretty pretty quickly. They don't. Have yeah, no, there's you know zero zero wait time, uh, so that that's much much better customer yeah. service. Yeah. yeah. Do you think in the in the near future? I mean, I'm assuming that you also have competitors that are doing something similar to Ago. Do you think that there's the, going to be this mindset shift about oh, I have to deal with, uh, you know, a chatbot on a website to, oh, it's going to be you know a simple solution within two or three minutes for this issue that I have. You know, as we were discussing at the beginning, there's this big issue, right? Now. And is the, do you think that there will be a mind shift, or is it we're so sunk sunk into this? I hate chatbots. I hate dealing with customer service. Yeah, so it's uh, it's actually pretty complex right now. And you know, we, as we talk to enterprise customers, it's very very confusing for them because, on the one hand, they have you know what I refer to as a thirty old. 30 year old technology of essentially a flow chart that you design. Now there's some pretty sophisticated tools that you can design these conversation flows with, but still it's essentially a flow chart that you're designing. And that's a technology they they already know. And a lot of companies have built their, you know, the internal skill set around those. Um, but they're pretty inadequate. I mean, one of the biggest banks, for example, um, you know, designed their own system. They we know they spent you know over hundred million dollars de de developing the system, and they have something like a three percent uh, use uptake. You know of of the system, and yeah, you try and use it, it's it's pretty awful because you know it's just a flow 
flowchart system. So a, a lot of companies are stuck with that old technology and they really can't easily move to a chatbot with a brain, you know, if they, if they found out about us. Um, but then, then of course, now in the last, uh, this year, you have all companies trying to jump onto the uh, large language model bandwagon, the chat GPT. And, it, you know, the, there's obviously this hype that, oh, this can do everything. And it is incredibly impressive when you talk to it. So you sort of think, surely we can use this to replace operators. So a lot of large companies are attempting to do that and they're failing, you know, because it can't be done. It literally cannot be done. You cannot ultimately get sign off from your legal system, legal department because the thing just isn't reliable enough. Uh, it's very hard to integrate it. It's, it's expensive. And the, the big problem in training it, you know, that it, it has this fixed, fixed memory. So there are all these, these, really fundamental technology problems but on the other hand the promise it seems so promising you know so companies are putting effort in, uh, in, uh, into that now you, you can use a large language model technology for example for um, natural language search on, on your website uh, you know it can be very effective for that but there you have the human in the loop you know people are used to it they do google search they oh, okay this is not relevant this is not relevant this looks wrong and and you know just kind of scroll through it and with large language models you could you can make that kind of faq search type thing um actually more more effective but it's still the human has to it, you know it's not you're following a procedure and a that it needs to update your backend system and follow business rules and that really the legal your legal department and your marketing and your user experience department can sign off on a complex transaction that that you need to do so so basically the companies are torn between this old technology uh, chat gpt the promise of chat gpt and then if they've heard of our our system it's you know uh, cognitive ai now unfortunately then um, for for customers, there there aren't really uh, any other companies uh, using cognitive AI. That we are the only company that has a chatbot with a brain, and it's a bit of an accident of history that um, statistical systems have been so incredibly successful over the last ten years in you know uh, sentiment analysis and 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 uh, things of that nature that all of the effort, almost all of the effort in AI has gone into statistical systems. Mm. And, um, you know, that's just just uh, where we are. So it is kind of a confusing uh, situation. But, you know, it, it, technology is going to, to continue uh, getting better. Now, the, the huge change is going to be when we get to truly human level AI. But that's another discussion which i'll be very happy to talk about as well yeah i, I mean uh we don't have that much time left but uh, yeah this is this is certainly something that uh i think is on the top of everybody's brains that are really considering and thinking about ai and, and kind of the future um, maybe we can tie that together with one of the other questions that i had so this might be a little bit out of scope with with the work that you're doing but you know one of the things that i really need in in the business that I'm running is a personal assistant, right? So I've I've tried hiring a couple human virtual assistants, but they're not great. And I think that um, uh, what Google's Duplex was proposing the idea of you know a real AI virtual assistant. So my question to you is: Is there any uh, future scenario or thought for um, Ego's future to move outside of just the the call center support and move towards something that more likely resembles a virtual mm -hmm. assistant or personal assistant especially as uh, cognitive AI gets closer and closer to the state of human level cognition well I'm, I'm very glad you asked the question because both in terms of what we're doing now uh, the answer is yes but very definitely in terms of um, the development we are uh, we are working on. So let me talk about what we currently do. Mm -hmm. So even though I've been talking about call center, uh, replacing call center agents, uh, that's sort of the most obvious uh, implementation. You know, there's 
you improve, you, you know, you make your customers happy and you make your CFO happy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a, it, it's a most obvious application right now, but our current technology is actually um, pretty much domain agnostic. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we can use the same technology, for example, as a, in the medical field as a diabetes coach, you know, as a kind of a personal coach that can help you manage diabetes. So it can learn uh, your food preferences, you know, uh, do you love broccoli or hate broccoli and, you know, or vegetarian, and it can then help you help guide you through uh, managing diabetes. So that that's a very good application for, uh, for a current technology, um, or for a student assistant and a university, you know, as you get to university, it's overwhelming, you know, yeah, yeah. but you can have this personal assistant that knows about you knows what, you know, what subjects you, you you're studying and where you live and all of that kind of stuff. And it can help you where to where to get your meals and your books and help your studies and so on. So that's, again, something uh, we are actually talking to some universities uh, to to provide that as a personal assistant. So these assistants are still more narrowly focused. So because giving it the kind of knowledge in a robust way that it's not going to make up stuff and, you know, uh, hallucinate, hallucinate yeah, yeah. Um, is, is uh, you know, is, is somewhat uh, challenging still, or so, somewhat expensive. Um, so that's why we can use our current technology in particular domains where it can act as a, as a personal assistant. Uh, we can also use our technology as a, a co-pilot, so complex software. So, for example, you have business intelligence software that might have lots of drop-down menus and options and so on, and customers aren't really utilizing it fully uh, because, you know, it's too complex and so on. So you can have an IGO as a front-end and say, you know, make me this graph, uh, you know, about last year summarizing by product and exclude, you know, something. Um, and then compare that to something else. Now, ChatGPT can can start to do that kind of thing as well. Uh, but again, kind of the robustness, and if you want to deeply integrate it into your uh, uh, product, um, you may be better off with something as predictive and reliable as our system. You know, but so the the current technology can certainly be used for personal assistant, for a co-pilot, or um, or really any conversational uh, uh, conversational application. Right. Now, in terms of the development that we're doing now, we just just two months ago we kicked off um, a new project within our company to focus directly on getting all the way to human uh, intelligence. You know, a dedicated uh, project. Whereas previously we'd been more incrementally improving our technology, but there's always been the tension between. What do our customers need right now versus, you know, what development do we need to do to really make the system uh, more intelligent? So we've now separated the two and we have a, a commercial development that's ongoing, but we've um, I'm now spending actually most of my time on, on the project, um, on the AGI project to basically get to um, human level intelligence. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, we will be able to fill your promise. And uh, it, I mean, I, I'm very, very excited about it. And this is really what I've been looking forward to for the last, you know, 20 years to, right. to get to that, uh, to get to this point. And, you know, uh, the personal assistant is definitely one of the targets. In fact, we call this a personal, personal, personal assistant. Okay. And the reason we do that yeah. is there are three different meanings of the word personal that apply. The first personal is that you own it. It serves your agenda, not some mega corporation. Right, right. Because, you know, as long as Amazon uh, owns it, they're probably not going to tell you about the specials at Walmart or if Apple. Mm -hmm. Apple is not going to tell you, Siri is not going to tell you uh, about the latest Samsung phone, I should imagine. Mm -hmm. So it's your you know, your personal assistant, you own it, it serves your agenda. The second personal is it's hyper personalized to you. You're not a demographic, you're an individual. It learns your preferences, your history, who your friends are, you know, the different relationships you have. So it learns all about you on an ongoing basis um, in, in real time. And then the third personal is the issue of privacy that you can decide what it shares with whom. You know, there's certain things you share with your spouse, other things you share with co-workers, and yet other things you might share with Amazon. Mm -hmm. 
So that is a very definite target for the uh, the, the new development that we we busy on is is the personal personal assistant, uh, which will be one of the applications we will we will have for for that technology. Uh, another very exciting application is of course to have um, AI researchers. Imagine you get you train one AI to be a PhD level cancer researcher. You can now make a million copies of that, and you have a million PhD level cancer researchers chipping away at the problem. Now, you know, with that, we are going to make uh, presumably much more rapid progress to solving, you know, and cancer is just one example. Of course, there are many other technical issues, um, material science, batteries and pollution, you know, uh, climate change and and um, you name it. So that's really the, the thing I'm working on is to have a brain at human level that can act as a personal, personal assistant and a researcher. Um, and of course, also reduce the cost of goods and services across the board. Yeah, this is, um, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. That is the excitement with AI, right? This is mm -hmm. the, the, what, the salute, the panacea to the world's problems, right? Many people have said uh, whether it, you know, will destroy us uh, is another question. We don't necessarily need to go down that road. But um, yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating when you think about it, when we get to human level intelligence, the kinds of benefits that can be experienced by all people across society and civilization is, um, it's really fascinating. Um, I, I, I'm i still going to stick to my desire for the personal or the, the PPP uh, yeah. uh, assistant, because uh, it's definitely something that I would um, need even right now. Do you have a, uh, a timeline, like a rough I mean, of course, you can't pinpoint the exact time, but is there a rough timeline as to when you think you'll be able to develop that? Um, yes, we are. We we have a roadmap for that. Uh, really, our biggest bottleneck right now is uh, funding. You know, we. Um, so when people ask me what is the timeline, I so I usually now measure it in dollars rather than uh, than years. Now, of course, you know, you still need to hire people and bring them up to speed. Uh, but we need to hire about 100 people for this project to really accelerate it, you know, to optimize it as to the, the amount of work we've already identified that needs to be done. And we believe we can get there in uh, in less than three years. Really? Oh, that's crazy. Uh, yeah. I think lots of people will be, I mean, I'm very happy to hear that, but I think lots of people will also be uh, fascinated to hear that. I, I think that, you know, I've had so many discussions about AI with so many people over the last year, especially. And there is a very, there's a large discussion debate going on about whether we'll he reach specifically human level AI, and then of course, super intelligence within the next, you know, five, 10 years or so. Um, and so many people are saying, ah, you know, it'll be 50 years, we won't reach it there. And then many people are even saying within the next year or something like that. So it's, um, it's interesting for me to hear that you have this this uh, goal or this expectation within three years, because I think that's it's vastly shorter than than most of the people that I've been talking to. Uh, assume. Yes, of course, for us, it's not three years. We've been working at it for, yeah, yeah. you know, more than 15 years, um, just with a very small team. Um, and I, I've written quite a bit about it. In fact, I just published two white papers on why don't we have AGI yet? And what will it take to get there? I've also written quite a few articles about, you know, the risks uh, or lack of risks from my perspective um, in, in AI that, you know, artificial intelligence or AGI will will really support human flourishing. And I, I, I believe that um, not blindly, you know, for, I think, good uh, good logical reasons. I think a lot of the talk about, the existential risks or dramatic risks of AI, um, uh, unfortunately, are promoted by academics that really don't have the, um, you know, was written uh, and then taken up by, by other people in the industry uh, that really don't have the technical understanding of how you build an AI. And, it, you know, it's not just going to have a mind of its own. Uh, it's built to do things for us. You know that is what we engineer it to do, and if they don't do that, we 
you know, we delete, <laughs> delete the copy and say, you know, it's a bug. It didn't work the way we right. expected it to work. So, but it, it, you know, it's, it, I, I don't want to trivialize it. It's not a, it's not a simple discussion and clearly there are uh, concerns and one, one needs to consider with very powerful AI. But uh, I think a lot of the concerns that are voiced right now are really very misguided. Okay, interesting. Uh, well, I'll, I'll definitely look at those white papers and I'll have them up on the show notes uh, for those that are interested in, in reading them. Um, I see that our, our time is, uh, is expired here, Peter. Um, are there any other maybe final thoughts that you want to leave with the audience with regards to maybe the future of, of AI? Well, as I said, I, I believe that um, AGI will will really help human flourishing. Um, and I think when we see a lot of the problems facing uh, facing humanity right now, it's the lack of intelligence, um, the lack of deep knowledge, the lack of good deep reasoning about things that is the, the cause of a, a lot of that, you know, where people just make bad decisions because our human brains are not actually designed to be super rational. You know, rationality is an evolutionary afterthought. Mm -hmm. uh, so we often react emotionally and with incomplete information and we don't think things through properly. And AIs will actually, AI will help us, will help us make better decisions and help us solve many of the problems uh, you know, facing like such as, as I mentioned, disease and so on. So obviously I'd love to hear from people who want to use our technology and enterprise customers and also anybody who wants to join us on the, the path of developing uh, human level AGI, uh, you know, any investors, collaborators or so, I'd uh, very much like to hear from them. Great. Well, I'll have your uh, your website up on the on the show notes. Uh, are there any other places that you would uh, like people to reach out to you or follow? Oh, it's very very easy to find me on you know LinkedIn, Twitter, or whatever, or Peter at Iger AI A I G O dot A I. So always happy to talk to people interested in human level intelligence. Perfect. Well, uh, I guess we'll leave it there. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for coming on the podcast and talking to. Uh, to me and us about uh, AI and and hopefully the future. Hopefully within three years, uh, I'll be getting a uh, I'll be one of your first customers if you get uh, one of the um, yep. personal 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 uh, assistants. I, yeah, I almost everybody we talk to says, "Yeah, I want one of those," and yeah. yes, I want one of those, and <laughs> <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. A lot of future shock people and future shock institutions in our society are simply overwhelmed. Once there is super intelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the super intelligence does. Science fact is catching up to science fiction. The first truly intelligent machine will be the last invention that humanity needs to make. The only scarcity that will exist in the future is that which we decide to create ourselves as humans. Within a 10 year design revolution, we can have all humanity living the highest and living anybody's ever known. Progress is uh, accelerating at an exponential pace and it's gonna reach a point where progress is so fast it's going to be a singularity. We are probably one of the last generations of homo sapiens. Every single headline points to the birth pangs of a type 1 civilization. Well thanks for listening to this week's Future Tech and Foresight podcast. If you like what you've heard here there are of course a number of ways that you can support the podcast. The best way would be to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or give a rating on Spotify, which you can find a step-by-step -step explanation for on the futuretechandforesight.com website. Alternatively, feel free to leave a comment either on the episode show notes or the YouTube channel where you can see video recordings of the interviews. And finally, if you are part of an organization that is aware of the disruptive and transformational impact that emerging and future technologies will bring and want to know more, please get in touch to hear about the strategic foresight services that we offer and how we can help future-proof your organization and take advantage of the phenomenal opportunities available to survive and thrive in the future.